Hi everyone, welcome to lecture five of CS287, Advanced Robotics. Uh, today we'll cover optimal control for linear dynamical systems and quadratic cost, uh, which at first might sound a little narrow, but uh, you'll see it's actually quite general. Before we do that, uh, quick reminder slash announcement, your um, homework one is due on Wednesday, okay? So you have a little, little less than a week left to complete your homework one. Any logistical questions? No? Okay. Let's move ahead. So there's this thing called Bellman's Curse of Dimensionality, which you might have encountered in your homework one if you're already working on it. Um, if you have an n-dimensional state space, the number of states in your state space will grow exponentially in the dimension n. Um, let's assume a fixed number of discretization levels per dimension. Let's say 10 discretization levels, then you have 10 to the n total states. And so as n gets even medium large, uh, not even medium large, just like medium, um, 10 to the n can already be pretty big and hard to cycle over all states. So in practice, discretization is considered only computationally feasible up to five or six dimensional state spaces, even when using variable resolution discretization and highly optimized implementations. Um, maybe you can push it a little beyond that if you have a little more patience to get your results out. Um, but that's kind of roughly the ballpark you can get to. As long as your system is six dimensional or less, you do a really good implementation, you can probably get um, this to work and optimal solutions out, no problem. But beyond that, it gets harder and harder. First approximation, might or might not work. Um, you don't have to enumerate all states there, you can sample them. Um, but because you're sampling them, you're actually not populating the entire state space anymore, which makes it more efficient computationally, but you might actually not anymore find the optimal solution because you're not populating the space to properly run that dynamic program, that value iteration is to find in a guaranteed way the optimal solution. So with function approximation, often solutions end up being a little more local uh, in practice. In this lecture, we're gonna look at optimal control for linear dynamical systems and quadratic costs, also known as the linear quadratic setting or LQ setting or LQR, linear quadratic regulator setting. It's a very special case and we can solve continuous state space optimal control exactly. And it will only require some linear algebra operations which are very tractable to do with matrices, dimensions of the state space. Um, so that's very feasible. So runtime will be order h, the horizon, and then n cubed where n is the dimensionality of the state space. Um, still, million dimensional state space might be hard, but most practical state spaces are not super large and n cubed will work out fine. Um, quick note, um, there's a great reference on this, it's totally optional, but if you want to learn more, there's a book by Anderson and Moore, Linear Quadratic Methods, and that's probably the most kind of tutorial style introduction, 100, 200 pages on this topic that we'll do in one lecture today, so there's more information in there if you want to learn more. There's also a very strong similarity with what we'll do today and what we'll do when we cover common filtering. Uh, when we do estimation, we don't have perfect access to the state directly, we just get sensory observations. We'll have a similar thing going on. To do it exactly in full generality will be very hard, but there will be a special case where we can do it exactly, and that will be called common filtering, and will be very similar to what we do today for optimal control. Okay, let's write out the assumptions under which we'll work today. So the LQR setting assumes a linear dynamical system. What does that mean? It assumes x t plus one equals a matrix A times xt plus a matrix B times ut. State here is denoted by x and then controls or actions by u. So xt is a state at time t, ut is the input at time t, and it'll assume a quadratic cost function. We've been working with rewards so far. In the optimal control literature, it's more customary to work with cost. 
ultimately it's all the same. You, if you want to work with rewards, you can just say, oh, the negative cost is my reward. And you'll have the same problem you're solving, but we'll follow the notation that's common in this space and we'll also use cost. So we'll be minimizing now rather than maximizing expected values. And so cost, let's call it G. G for being in state XT and taking action UT is equal to quadratic. That's the assumption. So it's going to be XT transpose Q XT plus UT transpose R UT. And there'll be some assumptions. Um, the assumption will be um, Q and R um, symmetric and Q and R both positive definite. What does it mean to be positive definite? It means this thing here, Q, Q positive definite if and only if for all Z that are the right form factor, Z transpose Q Z bigger than zero. Same for R. Okay, so those are our assumptions. Yes, question? That's if um, Z is not equal to zero. Correct, that's a good point. For all Z not equal to zero, it has to be strictly bigger than zero, thanks. Now, what that means is that the cost is non-zero everywhere except when you're at the zero point. If you have zero state, zero controls, cost is zero. That's the best place to be. Everything else is worse. Um, and we can also see that the system is set up that this is actually possible to achieve. If, this, if the state is zero and control is zero, you'll be at zero again. So this is the kind of problem where the optimal solution will drive you to zero and stay there for all times. Um, now, one thing I want to mention here, a bit of an aside, but if you think about, let's say, this form here, x transpose q x t. Um, matrices are a little harder to think of than scalar entities. So it can be good to first think, okay, what does this mean when it's scalar? When it's scalar, it just means like it's a parabola. If x is a scalar, just x squared times some scale factor. And for it to be positive definite, that scale factor has to be positive. So it's a parabola that's shaped with a minimum. That's what it looks like in the scalar case. Now, in higher dimensional cases, well, one thing you know, if a matrix is symmetric, or hopefully you know, and otherwise you'll find out now, um, if a matrix is symmetric, for every symmetric matrix Q, Q is equal to some orthogonal transformation, which are the eigenvectors, um, let's call them V, lambda, which is diagonal, V uh, transpose. So this one is diagonal. And V transpose V is the identity matrix. So V is an orthogonal matrix, meaning that all it's doing is rotating things. So what happens is when you multiply something with a symmetric matrix, effectively you just rotate it, then rescale it, rotate it back. If you multiply it from both sides, from the front with X transpose and the back with X, you are on both sides just rotating the X, and then in the rotated space, rescaling the coordinates. And so if that's all you're doing is rotating things and then rescaling, all that is doing is a change of coordinate system, that's just a rotation. So when you, when you try to build some intuition about this, you can say, well, if I look at this cost function in the, if I pick the simplest possible coordinate system, I pick the one where everything's already rotated ahead of time, and then this V matrix will not have to do any rotation anymore. It'll just kind of disappear, it'll be an identity. And then really, Q is just a diagonal matrix doing rescaling. And so in the correct, or the easiest coordinate system, really what this costs is just squaring each of the coordinates of X and rescaling those squares with a positive number. That's all it's doing. It's just that sometimes your coordinate system is off and you need to first rotate, and then you do the uh, squaring and, and uh, scaling. So that can give us 
some intuition about what this is. It's really just penalizing every coordinate for being away from zero, but it's not doing it in an axis-aligned way necessarily, and hence it can be a general symmetric matrix, doesn't have to be a diagonal matrix. In practice, almost everybody picks a diagonal matrix. It's much easier to pick a diagonal matrix as your cost function than to fill in a whole uh, non-diagonal uh, cost matrix. Then the other thing that you might be curious about, Q and R have to be symmetric, I'm saying. Um, what happens if you pick a non-symmetric Q or R? OK, let, let's see what happens. Uh, we'll do it as a little aside. Um, we'll pick a non-symmetric Q, let's say. So what do we have? Only way this Q appears, actually, I shouldn't. Usually there's a one half put in front, which is just some kind of scaling. Doesn't really matter too much, but when you take derivatives, the, you get a two, and then a one half and a two cancel, which makes it nice. Um, so imagine we're looking at x transpose qx. But now let's actually not call it q, because we don't want to make the same assumptions we made before. Maybe it's not a symmetric matrix. Imagine it's just some matrix. A. Well, A we already have there. Let's pick some letter we don't have yet. Let's say it's, um, we don't have and will not have anytime soon matrix F, I think. So, <laughs> X transpose FX. F not symmetric. What happens? Okay, let, let's take a look at what happens. X transpose FX is equal to not symmetric. So for a non-symmetric matrix, we can actually write it as F plus F transpose over 2 plus F minus F transpose over 2. We're just adding and subtracting F transpose. OK. So. Let's rewrite it that way. So what we really have is x transpose f plus f over f transpose over 2 times x plus x transpose f minus f transpose over 2 x. Now look at this one here. This one is x transpose f x over 2 minus x transpose f transpose x over 2. OK, now when you have matrices and you have, let's say, a, b, c transpose, that's the same as C transpose B transpose A transpose. That's how, how it works. If you have a scalar value, these are scalar values, you transpose a scalar value, it stays the same. So we might as well replace this one, which is just a scalar, with its transpose. Then we apply this thing over here, and we see this one is equal to x transpose, can people see that from the back, the bottom row? OK. x transpose fx over 2, which cancels with this one. So this form here is equal to 0. So all we're left with from x transpose fx is x transpose, x transpose the symmetric part of f times x. So by using non-symmetric matrices, you actually don't gain anything. You, you just in some sense, obscuring the fact that in reality, all you're using is the symmetric part of that non-symmetric matrix. And so we might as well not obscure those things. Might as well say, well, it's clear. We only ever use the symmetric part of the matrix. So let's just from the beginning say we only use symmetric matrices, because what's the point in introducing an F and then really be working with F plus F transpose over 2? Let's just directly work with a symmetric matrix, which we know is the essence of what's happening anyway. Not just the essence, everything that's happening is the symmetric part. So the fact that I said Q and R have to be symmetric 
is not really a restriction on the formalism. It's just a way to be more transparent about what's really happening. Only the symmetric part is used anyway, might as well do it up front. The fact that they have to be positive definite should be clear why you want that. We're going to be minimizing cost. And if there's any way to achieve a negative value, if there is something that achieves a negative value here, whatever that is, then you're going to want to go to infinity in that direction z to minimize cost, which would be some very negative value. And that's not really an interesting problem. Like try to send off your system to infinity is typically not an interesting problem to solve. And so to make the problem interesting, it has to be positive definite, so there is a clear goal to be achieved. And the symmetric thing is just, as you saw there, it's just a way of being transparent about what's going to happen anyway. Any questions about this? Now, one thing you might say is, well, hmm, linear quadratic systems, that's maybe you love matrix algebra, and you're like, that, that sounds fun, um, but maybe it sounds very limiting to you, and you're saying, am I really going to stick around in this lecture today, because all we're going to see maybe is just these linear systems. So I'm going to give you a quick heads up that we can do a lot with these systems. By the way, we have a slide with the, 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 the description here. What we're going to cover in the first part of the lecture is to solve this specific problem that I wrote on the board. What we'll do in the remainder of lecture is see how we can use it as the core to solve more difficult problems. How difficult? Essentially arbitrary nonlinear systems. So one good example of a very uh, nonlinear system is a helicopter. Helicopter flight as the helicopter itself is nonlinear dynamics. Um, due to just how rotations interact, uh, how rotations are represented. Um, they're kind of a complex thing to, to deal with. But then also the airflow around the helicopter makes it highly nonlinear. And so there's a lot of complicated dynamics happening. It's definitely not xt plus 1 equal axt plus but, not even close. But what we'll see first is the core of how to solve this, then how to extend this so we can start doing things like this. So we're going to watch here is a autonomous helicopter um, that will go through essentially the entire flight envelope of the helicopter, do every possible maneuver expert pilots could demonstrate and at actually higher precision and similar speed as the expert pilots do. So this was some of my PhD work several years ago. This is all powered by LQR under the hood, inverted takeoff. Then it hovers. That's actually a hard problem in itself to stay in place with the helicopter. Very difficult problem. Checkbox, mark, then a split S, it's a way to change direction. Um, very nonlinear. The dynamic is not even close to linear anywhere here. It's tall turn, nothing close to linear. Um, dynamics is continually changing also due to the airflow around the helicopter. It can do spins at the top. come out tail first, go up to 55 miles an hour at maximum speed. Um, it can go inverted. And so, this is a highly unstable regime to fly in because when you're inverted, just like holding up a broom, when you're holding up a broom on the palm of your hand, it's easy to tip over. Um, and you're holding up the body of the helicopter here, then flips rolls, none of it anywhere close to linear, but we'll actually be able to solve this problem, at least the control part of this problem, with the machinery we're going to build up today. So let's work through that machinery. So remember value iteration. 
In control, people often use J rather than V, and J for cost. So if we had valid iteration, it would be J for i plus 1 steps to go for being in state S equals min, because we're minimizing now over controls u. The cost encountered in that first step plus then the sum over future states probability of being in that future state given state in action times the optimal cost to go. So often, a, sometimes, sometimes we'll call it value, sometimes we'll call it cost to go. It's very common to call it cost to go, which is all costs you expect to encounter when actively on, on, then onwards for i time steps starting in state s prime. OK, so now we have those assumptions over there. LQR, what does it say? Well, let's fill it in. J i plus 1, and we're going to have x now for state. J i plus 1 for x is the min over u. What are we doing? Well, the cost, g, is written over there. It's going to be x transpose qx plus u transpose r u, maybe with a 1 half. We can kind of choose. Um, the 1 half is good to let things cancel out later. Then plus sum over all next states x prime. But actually, with sum over all next states x prime, we have a deterministic system here. x t plus 1 equals x t plus b u t. So we don't really need to sum over it. Um, it's just going to be one next state x prime. We even know what it is. That's state x prime. So j i steps to go for x prime, which is equal to a x plus b u. So we're trying to minimize this. Remember how we did value iteration? We said with zero steps to go, it's easy. So OK, let's, let's do that. So we'll start with zero steps to go. When there's zero steps left, in this case, we're not going to set it to zero. We could set it to zero. But we're actually going to set it to j. 0x equals x transpose p0x. All right. Looks like in the slides I did it without the 1 half, so let's not do the 1 half on the board either. Um, so, if we set p0 equal to all zeros, this means there is no end cost. But if p0 is different from all zeros, then essentially we're saying if you don't end up at the all zero state, we have a preference between different states you might end up in. Along some axes, maybe there's a higher cost to end up somewhere far out there compared to other axes. Now, j1 of x equals, well, we wrote it over there. So let's rewrite that. Um, min over u of x transpose qx plus u transpose ru plus ji of this thing. Well, that's j0 here. j0 is x transpose p0x. So we need we fill that in. We have then. Ax plus Bu transpose P0 Ax plus Bu. OK, and now we want to find the U that minimizes this. To find the U that minimizes this, what do we do? We compute the gradient with respect to U of that quantity. Well. Let's see, what do we end up with? Great respect to u of this quantity over here. This doesn't have u in it, so no, nothing. u transpose ru, that becomes 2ru. Then this thing over here becomes plus 2 times b transpose p0ax plus bu. 
And they want this to be equal to zero. If we can find the solution for that equal to zero, we found the optimal control u. Well, if we do this, we find u is equal to negative. So the u appears here and appears here. We just need to do some grouping of terms and move to the other side. End up with negative r plus b transpose p0 b inverse b transpose p0 a x. So we have a nice closed form for u, which is nice. That means we don't have to discretize u. We don't have to search over the best u. We actually have a closed form u as a function of x. And this we'll also call k times x. So we'll call this what's sitting in front here k. Then what we can do, we can fill u equals k times x into this thing over here to see what actually our value is at x. Once we fill in the optimal u, we can find out the value for that state x. Once we do that, what we end up with is let me write it over here, top of the board. Filling in, that's just a bit of simplification. You don't have to do anything special. We find j1 of x equals x transpose p1x for p1 equal q plus Q plus this, actually, let's, let's call this thing K1 because it's specific to the first uh, iteration. It'll be Q plus K1 transpose R K1 plus A plus B K1 transpose P0 a plus b k1 and k1 equals minus r plus b transpose p0 b inverse b transpose p0 a. So what this shows is if we want to find the value function for one time step to go, we just need to compute k1 this will give us p1, and then we have the value function for one time step to go. Now, the amazing thing that's happening here, and this is very unique to the linear quadratic setting, and that's why it's so popular and a building block for other things. The amazing thing that's happening here is that this thing here is of the same form factor as we started with. We again have a quadratic. j0 was a quadratic, and then j1 is a quadratic in x which means that we can repeat this process again. If we want to find j2, we just need to up all the indices here by, by one, and we'll have the same thing we can do, and repeat, repeat, repeat. For most systems, let's say you had a polynomial system, for most systems what will happen is the degree of the polynomial will keep increasing as you do this, and things will become more and more complex. But we kind of get lucky here because, well, when we take the gradient, the degree drops by one, and so the solution has, is just linear in x, and we fill it in, we stay quadratic, and this never changes. Computationally, this is very feasible. I mean, this is just some matrix vector multiplies, some matrix inverse, some matrix matrix multiplies, same thing here. So computationally, this is very practical, order n cubed, where n is the dimensionality of your space. Any questions about this? This is the core idea for today. Um, yes, actually, we have, we have uh, 
We still have the thingy today. Let's see. Ooh. <laughs> Obstacle, sorry. So can P0 be any arbitrary matrix? So can P0 be any arbitrary matrix? Um, P0 has to be positive definite for this to be meaningful. Because if P0 is not positive definite, you could still go, essentially what would happen is setting the grand equal to 0, for that to be the right point, your function needs to be shaped to have a unique minimum. Otherwise, you have to go inspect where the grand is 0. Is it a minimum or a maximum or a saddle point? And so because P0 is positive definite, unique minimum for the quadratic form, when we set grand equal to 0, we know we have the unique minimum. And that's the right thing. If P0 were the other way, shaped like that, and you went through the same math, um, well, then what you would find here is actually the way to achieve the maximum. And what you'd be doing is maximizing that objective. So there's kind of some, something kind of weird, weird going on um, that's not very natural. Um, so, so what does P0 mean, like, intuitively? Intuitively, P0 means um, how much you care about being close to 0 along different axes. So quadratic forms, you can draw them from above. As let's say, maybe you draw a quadratic form like this. What this means is that maybe the quadratic form is a value of 1 here, 2 here, 4 over here. And so what that means is that if you deviate in this direction from 0, things increase very rapidly, incur very high cost very quickly. So that's a bad place to end up if you can avoid it. Whereas in this direction, it increases much more slowly. So let's say you don't have enough time steps left to drive yourself all the way to the 0 point. Obviously, you want to be at 0. Let's say you don't have enough time steps left. You'd rather end up somewhere here away from 0 than here. And in fact, um, this is just P0, but if Q, let's say, were shaped the same way, if Q and P0 were, were the same, right, then at all times, you would prefer to be along this axis if you're not there yet. So if you start out, let's say, I don't know, over here, you'd prefer to as quickly as possible get this way and then come in this way. Now, if it's possible, of course, you might even prefer to go even faster directly to the goal, but the dynamics will limit you in what you can do. And so within what the dynamics allows you to do, you'll prefer paths that along axes where you're not penalized as much, you, you're willing to have more deviations still um, if you have to make trade-offs. So P0 and Q are really trade-offs is what they define. So one example would be for a helicopter, maybe you say, you know what, I care a lot about position and orientation. And some entries in Q and P0 will be related to position, some will be related to orientation. I think you might give it some thought. You might say, well, actually, I probably care more about orientation. Why? Because if orientation is off, things get very complicated. And if I were to, let's say, approximate my helicopter with a linear system, well, the nonlinearities will start kicking in much more quickly if my orientation is off. But if I'm off by position, the nonlinearities will not kick in actually at all, because where, where you are as a helicopter, the dynamics is not affected by your position. Similar thing would be, let's say, you were controlling a cart pole. You're doing card pole balancing. Um, well, card pole balancing, if the angle here changes, the dynamics will be very different. The linearization of the dynamics will be very different. But if your location has changed, the linearization of the dynamics will be the same. And so what happens is, if you are thinking about how should I design my cost function, if I know I'm going to use a linear approximation to the system, then I should design my cost function in a way that the linear approximation is as good as possible. So I'm going to think about my dynamics and say, oh, position is less critical than orientation. Let me put a lot of penalty on orientation so it always keeps it nicely up. And then it can worry about position later because, not because I care about it later, it's not, but because I think it's going to fail otherwise. Because my linear system that approximates the real system will become imprecise. And my whole calculation based on linear system will not be sufficiently precise to give me the correct solution. And so in practice, there's a lot of that going on. As you design your, your P0 and your Q, your R, and if you approximate your system with a linear system, which is what we're going to do, because most systems are not linear, we're going to approximate them that way, you're going to have to think about how can I ensure my linearization is good? And your cost matrices can help you ensure that you're more likely to be in the regime where your linearization is good. 
So there's a lot of intricacies going on there. It's probably a longer answer than you were looking for, but that, that's kind of the, the design aspects of it. Want to throw the box back? Oh, nice. Were there other questions? OK. So we now understand how to solve a linear quadratic system. Let's show the slides that have the lytic math on this. So this is what we did on the board. We derived that ultimately you get back to a quadratic form, and this is the, all the calculus you have to do, just linear algebra. So since we have that, we end up where we started. J1 is just like J0. So we can go from J1 to J2, just like we went from J0 to J1. And for all times, we have a closed form update. This is pretty crazy, by the way. Like you. You could try to give it a lot of thought and say, can I come up with any other dynamical systems and cost functions where if I do a value iteration backup, I can get an analytical solution. And then after the analytical solution, I get the same form factor back so I can just do this repeatedly and nothing blows up in terms of what I need to represent. Um, I don't know of any others. I mean, there's a discrete case where we just enumerate, but in terms of continuous spaces, this is the only one I'm aware of where it just stays nicely in closed form. So that's how we get J2. And then the full solution will be just iterating this. We just compute K, KI, PI, and keep repeating. The optimal policy for I step horizon will be just pi of x is KI times x. So you just store your KIs and just then use them at the appropriate time step. And if you want to know how much cost do I expect to get from this particular state x, it's xi tra x transpose PI x. Um, it's a little fact here that is guaranteed to converge the infinite horizon optimal policy if and only if the dynamics AB is such that there exists a policy that can drive the state to zero. In some sense, this is intuitive. If there exists a way to drive the state to zero, then definitely in the infinite horizon case, you should, um, you should drive it to zero. So at some point, you stop encountering costs. So these PIs will start converging because you're bounded in how much cost you're ever going to encounter. If it's a path that drives you to zero, whatever the cost of that path, that's an upper bound on what the optimal control will do in the infinite horizon case. And if you're upper bounded and your series is always going up, it's guaranteed to converge, and so you have convergence. Often people do that. They just keep running until convergence and use, just use a steady state feedback matrix for all times, even for finite horizon problems, because, well, it's convenient to store only one matrix rather than having to keep track of time and many, many matrices. Let's revisit our assumptions now. So we made a bunch of assumptions here. What this really is about right now is about keeping a linear system at the all zero state while preferring to keep the control inputs small. How can we extend this? We can actually extend this to affine systems Systems with stochasticity, regulation around non-zero fixed point for a nonlinear system, penalization for changing control inputs, linear time varying systems, trajectory following for nonlinear systems. So we have a lot of extensions to cover. Um, let's take a small break here, start again in two, three minutes. And in the meantime, I'll just project what we have as our main result so far.
then how come we can still set it to one? Oh, if we don't have anything, then we can set it to zero. Or if we want to find the infinite horizon version. If we set it to zero, wouldn't you start giving zero? At the very end, it would be. For the last time step, it would be. But from then onwards, it would not be anymore. So if P so if P zero is zero, that means K one is also zero. K one will be zero. Yeah, K one for one time step to go. So P one will be non-zero, and essentially it'll start accumulating from there. So P one will be Q. P one will be yeah, because K one is correct. So if you start with start P zero equals zero, you're effectively starting with P zero equal Q, and Waiting one one iteration later. Mm -hmm. So P zero can be fun with semi -minimizer. Yes, as long as Q is positive definite. Q and R are really the ones that matter here. So um, uh, if we want to show that this successive application of a one step optimal strategy is optimal globally, do we have to apply some sort of like dynamic program to do that? Like, let's say we have a finite horizon, and then we mm -hmm. work like backwards and show mm -hmm. that this is optimal. Like, it's like an optimal. The optimal reason it's optimal globally is just because it's valid version. Oh, We're doing exact valid version, and we know valid version is optimal. Okay. So it's a direct consequence of that. I see. All right. Um, let's restart. So one question that came up during break is, how do we know this is optimal? And the reason we know this is optimal is that this is valid iteration. And we know valid iteration is optimal. It's just that we just found out that we can actually do valid iteration exactly in a continuous state space under this set of specific assumptions on dynamics and cost. But now, let's start revisiting those assumptions. How about affine systems? What does that mean? There's an offset there. This means you can actually not keep the system at zero. Think about it. Because if x is, xt is zero, ut is zero, then xt plus one will be c. So you'll continually ac keep accumulating cost. There's no way around it here. There's, I mean, the, the, because whenever you're not at zero, you get a cost, and you cannot stay at zero. You can still go through the same math. Um, one way you can do it is you can say, well, I'm going to go through the you know, same math I did before, redrive the update, and that could be a good exercise. You, know, you just do all the math we did in previous slides. So there will just be some extra offset terms coming around. Um, so then the control, U optimal control will not just be matrix K times X, it will be matrix K times X plus some offset, because you need to apply offset control. Another thing you can do, and which we're going to do a lot in what we're going to see in these extensions, you can redefine your state space. So we can say, what if our state space is actually, we call it z now, and there is xt plus 1, which I had before, but an extra entry of 1. If we set it up that way, a slightly bigger state, then we can actually write it again as a linear system in z space. And we can then say, OK, now we can reapply all the equations we've seen before. We just solving it in z space, and then we need to apply control. We just need to make sure that, OK, we turn our x into a z, which is x and a 1 at the bottom. And then we multiply with the k matrix that we found to get the controls. Um, so it's a little trick to not have to re-implement anything when you go from linear to affine. How about stochastic systems? Um, imagine you have a wt here that's not an offset term. Its mean is 0, but it has variance, non-zero variance. So there's some noise in the system. I encourage you to do this as an exercise to see if you kind of fully understand everything we derived. You can work through the same derivation that I did on the board. It's now stochastic, so you'll have an expectation. Expected value. And in the expected value, what you'll see appear, well, the expected value of w multiplied with anything that's not w will be 0. That'll simplify out. But the expected value of w multiplied with w is a covariance matrix for w, and that will be carried throughout. And it will show that, actually, you have a higher expected cost. Why? Well, it's natural. You have noise in the system. You can't control it as precisely when you have this noise. But the funny thing is that the optimal control policy, the k matrices you'll find, are exactly the same. They don't change. You'll just see that 
you'll have an expected higher cost, but use the exact same control strategy. Kind of an uh, interesting result. Some people call this certainty equivalent control. Like in this particular setting, even though there is uncertainty in the system, you can design your optimal controller ignoring the uncertainty, and it'll give the same result in terms of your strategy. How about nonlinear systems? Um, xt plus 1 is f of xt comma ut. We can keep the state, we can keep the system at state x star even only if there exists some u star such that x star equals f of x star u star. That's what it means to be a fixed point. Let's assume there's a fixed point in the system. Then we can see can we stabilize it around that fixed point? That's like keeping a helicopter in hover, keeping a card pull uh, balanced at the top. It's nonlinear, but there's a stable point. And the question is, how can you stabilize around it? Because usually there's a stable point. Sure, you might say, I just stay there and practice this perturbations. I need to be able to steer back onto it. So it's not enough to know U star to, to stay there. You need to know a feedback strategy to stay there. Linearizing dynamics around X star, what would it give you? Well, XT plus 1 equals, this is a first order Taylor expansion of the dynamics at X star U star. Well. That's really A and B. Or equivalently, we can write it as xt plus 1 minus x star equals axt minus x star plus but minus u star. If we now redefine our coordinate system, send it around x star and u star, we'll call that z, and for u we call it v, then we have exactly what we had before. zt plus 1 equals azt plus bvt, and then our cost will be, well, some cost for staying close to that. So we don't have to write any new code to find the linear quadratic optimal control around a stable point, not a stable point, and a, a stationary point of a nonlinear system. OK. So just run a standard LQR. Once you've done that, you need to find your controls. For, first, you'll turn your x into z. You'll find v from that. Then you can turn your v into your u, and here it is, the equation to find u. All right. Here's another one. What if instead of penalizing for the controls, you want to penalize for the change in controls? Um, why might you care about this? Well, often what happens um, when you have a system, let's say this is your system, and you run it. Um, in the real world, your optimal controller, what you'll find is that there'll be a lot of high frequencies, very high frequency control. Even if in the simulator, when you run this, it might not be the case. But in reality, there's always a little bit of noise. There's a little bit of mismatch between re reality and, and your uh, simulated system. So your optimal controller, since it thinks everything is deterministic, is going to actually use pretty large controls typically and constantly adjust the controls to whatever at that moment looks best. Um, and you typically don't want that, because typically what happens is when you have high frequency controls for a physical system, um, those high frequencies are hard to model. And actually the model that you're using, your linear system model that you have, is often not very precise for the high frequencies. For example, for a helicopter at high frequency, you just shake it apart, it rips itself apart at high enough frequency. And so that's not great, because um, you have the, all these kind of modes really of the physical system that are not modeled in your, in your uh, control model that you have for your system. So you want to avoid those high frequencies. Okay, so what you can do, one thing you can do, Anderson and Moore looks at this, is you can frequency shape the cost function. What does that mean? You would say, well, I'm going to add extra variables to my state. So I don't just have xt, but I also have xt minus 1, xt minus 2, xt minus 3, xt minus 4. I keep them all around in the state. That's easily done. You can expand your A matrix to have some effectively identities to memorize things from the past for a while. And then you can essentially um, set up something that penalizes for rapid changes in, in those. Um, or you can even um, set up a very specific filter on your past states if you have a certain frequency that you specifically want to suppress. Like maybe there's a, some kind of, you've done an analysis of your physical system and there's a certain frequency at which the system has a resonancy and the physical system will start accumulating energy and shaking itself apart that you might want to minimize anything that happens at that frequency. And you put a, something in your cost function to just avoid that frequency. Simple special case, 
which works very well in practice, just penalized for changing control inputs. How do we do that? Um, this is our original problem. Um, but now we want to penalize for changing controls. Well, solution A is to augment the state with the past control input vector. So we have xt, but also ut is stored in the state. And then we can penalize for how the new input is different from the one we've already stored in the state. Um, solution method B is the one we'll cover is you actually change the dynamical system to be expressed in terms of the changing control input rather than the actual control input. So for some reason, maybe originally you were controlling, I don't know, velocity, and now you're effectively controlling acceleration. And you want to keep your acceleration small rather than keeping your velocity small. OK, or maybe you want to keep both small. That's fine, too. So what does it look like? Oh, this. What we have is, oh, weirdly animated. But OK, um, xt plus 1, ut is our new state variable. We can get that from xt and ut minus 1, which at the previous time are in our state. And then the delta in, state, in controls comes into b. This ut minus 1 also gets multiplied with b. So actually, in the top row, we get the original dynamics. xt plus 1 equals axt plus b ut minus 1 plus b delta ut. So that's the same as plus b ut. And the bottom row is just keeping track of the controls uh, from the previous time. So this is what we have just a redefinition of our state and input space. Our cost can be the same we had before, where now there is an R prime introduced. Our original Q is here, original R is here, and there's an additional R prime to penalize for the change in controls. And this then matches the standard LQR format shown above. I'd say for pretty much any physical system, you're going to want to do this. It pretty much never works without doing something like this. Then, what else might we want to generalize to? Linear time varying systems. So we had stationary system before. Now there's an index there. The dynamics depends on time, AT, BT. Well, in all the math we did, there was nothing that assumed A and B would be staying the same over time. We can work through the exact same math, exact same update equation. We just need to keep track of the time indices. It will not converge then. If A and B vary over time, you're not going to get the same convergence properties. But you can do the exact same math and find a time varying linear controller that's appropriate for your time varying linear system. So update equations will look exactly the same, just need to keep track of the time indices. You might wonder how often do you really run into a time varying linear system? Like that would be quite coincidence. It's not linear, but it's time varying linear. That would be kind of really special. In practice, it's rare to have a time varying linear system that's actually what you run into, but it's very common to run into a nonlinear system. And if you know the path you're going to follow in state space that you're trying to follow, then you can approximate in a time varying way with sequence of matrices your dynamical system as a linear time varying system. So, different linear approximation at each time step to what is actually a nonlinear system. And so you'll get linear time varying control, and you'll get, again, quadratic costs. So let's look at what I just described, which is the most direct application of this kind of linear time varying setting. We want to do trajectory following for nonlinear systems. For example, we want our helicopter to follow a specific path. Helicopter is nonlinear, so we can't do the linear thing. But what can we do? Well, let's assume there's a feasible target trajectory. It's something that the helicopter can actually do, or our system can actually do. How would we know what that is? That's not necessarily easy to know. But let's assume we know it. Maybe from somebody already executing it, a human pilot maybe. Or maybe from having a precise analytical model and you can somehow derive what is a feasible sequence of states. Well, feasible means that there exist controls such that this trajectory gets followed. You might say, well, then wouldn't it be enough to just apply the sequence of controls and we're done? Why do we still need to do any work? The reason we still need to do some work is typically, even though you know your sequence that would follow the trajectory in principle, there will be perturbations. It will be thrown off your trajectory. Why? Well, there could be explicit perturbations like noise, wind pushing your helicopter around, or there could be things that your F that you have there is not perfect. It's imprecise. And so even though you think it's feasible, 
it's actually not feasible. And you can think of the mismatch between the real F and the F you work with also as noise. It's not necessarily a noise per se, it's not a noisy process, it's just that there's a mismatch between your F that you use and the real one, and so real update plus some noise is really what you're working with. So our problem statement then becomes, let's minimize the quadratic deviation from our target states at all times, and quadratic deviation from our target inputs. Um, and then, well, you might say, why do we penalize this? Why do we need to stay close to our target inputs? Well, we can think of, in some sense, this as zero centering. We know the controls that we need if there's no perturbations, and so that's a strong prior. And we're going to penalize for deviating from that, because we know that's the right place to be. And then if we need to deviate, sure, we do it to stay on track, but by default, we're going to try to stay close to U star. Then we transform this into a linear time-varying case. Again, Taylor expansion. X t plus 1 is some function of x star t, u star t, plus then what will be our a and b for those respective times, times x t minus x t star, u t minus u t star. And so here's our linear time varying system in a new coordinate system, the x minus x star and u minus u star coordinate system. And at this point, we're actually good to go we can do the standard thing where we transformed it, we're going to standard LQR backup operations, and the resulting policy at i times it from the end will be this thing over here, which we knew is going to be that format because it's just a linear time varying system at this point. And the target trajectory need actually not be feasible to apply this technique, so if you actually don't have a feasible trajectory, you can still go through the same math, but you'll have to keep track of an extra term here um, in what you do. So I should have an affine system rather than a linear system, and so you have to keep track of that. If your trajectory is uh, feasible, it'll uh, work out fine. Yes? Oh, good question. What if we only have access to the states, not the actions? Um, then we wouldn't know the U stars. We couldn't center it around them. And so we would have, we would end up with not necessarily knowing where we want U to be centered. We might just, we might essentially have no U star here. Let's just set it to zero. That's maybe the best we know. And you can actually work through the same math, but again, you'll end up with an offset here. So whenever the trajectory is not feasible, because effectively what we're doing is we're replacing the U stars with zeros, it's an infeasible trajectory, we'll end up with offset term over here. And so we'll have an affine system to deal with rather than a um, linear system. But other than that, we can still run through the same math. Question here. Yeah. You want to take the mic for a moment? This is fun. Uh, does the, um does error tend to like accumulate in the system? Because you like you, you have your defined trajectory and then you're off by mm -hmm. a little bit and you keep going yeah. off and off and off. So absolutely. Um, when you're trying to follow a trajectory, typically an error will happen. And then error meaning you thought you're steering right back onto it, you were off, but you thought, you know, optimally controlling back onto it. But then there's a perturbation, either a mismatch in dynamics, so you're actually not steering onto it because you had a wrong model you're using, or there is maybe an actual perturbation, a force applied to your system that is an external perturbation, and you'll still be off. And so then really what matters is whether you're good at steering on relatively quickly compared to the perturbation force. And the perturbation force is very, very strong, pushes you very hard, and the level at which you're able to steer back on is smaller than that, you'll end up not getting back on, and it might go unstable. If your ability to control back on is very good, then Yes, you'll, you'll never actually be on the target trajectory. You'll always be around it, but you'll stay around it. And so it really depends on your control bandwidth there. Do you have the ability to keep it on, or do you have not enough control to keep it on? Like, for example, a helicopter, if you're flying it in wind gusts up to like 10, 20 miles an hour, can keep it on. But wind gusts, like, I don't know, 100 miles an hour, there's no way we keep it on the trajectory. It just doesn't have the ability to, to counter that. Over there. Behind you first. Yeah, no oh, oh, this. <laughs> try way too much arch. Um, so, what is, what is the component here that keeps the 
So the, what's going to keep us on track is the feedback matrix here. So the controls we choose are going to be such that if we deviate from where we were supposed to be, if, let's say if we already were exactly where we were supposed to be at that time, then we'll just apply U star for that time. This is saying how much we're going to deviate from U star. And so if we're off from the trajectory, this K matrix will describe what controls we need to use to steer back on. Why does this happen? Well, the original optimization problem says that we need to stay close to the X stars. That's in the objective. So the optimum is to be on. And then that feedback matrix is just a consequence of our objective. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> we have time for one more. You, are, you also had a question, right? So it seems like the problem at the top of the page is equivalent to a convex optimization problem. I don't know if you know whether or not that's true or not. But if it is true, why not just use a solver rather than LQR backup? Yeah, so it's a good question. Next week we'll see, we'll look at ways to use solvers to solve for this. Um, if you just solve it here, thanks Eric. Um, if you solve this as a convex problem, just finding the use, you'll just find the use. You will not find a feedback controller. But we'll see extra things we can put around it to get there. But um, in practice, the nice thing about solving it this way is in some sense that you're exploiting all the structure in the problem. Because um, it's actually a dynamic programming problem. So we're actually using all the structure available to us to find a solution, including a feedback matrix, including a cost to go matrix. And that will be really helpful. Um, as we'll see, as even we see other methods to solve this, we'll still be very interested in a feedback matrix and a cost to go matrix. Here you go. Over there. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so is it possible to like interlink two different LQR problems? For example, like use an easier uh, model that kind of captures what's going on but deviates from reality to solve for the U star and then have another model on the top and inc um, includes the nonlinear part and put in the nonlinear following. Yeah, trajectory. I mean, I think that that's a very good idea in that often solving for the X stars, U stars is difficult and if you can have ideas of how to simplify solving for it and building up to it. Um, I don't know of any kind of extremely principled way to get this done, but definitely people will try all kinds of things to find the X star, U star. We'll see more of that next week. So let's defer questions about how to find X star and U star to next week, because we'll, we'll see ways to do it then. All right. Yeah, you got a far throw ahead of yourself. Careful, everyone. <laughs> nice. How about the most general case? We just want to solve this thing. How could we do this? Well, one thing you could say, well, why not use a black box optimization solver? Maybe we can find the use. But again, we'll just find the use. We'll not find a feedback matrix. We'll not find a um, cost to go function. And in fact, we'll not necessarily be exploiting the structure of the problem. We can actually iteratively apply LQR. And this is a very powerful way of doing this. So let's step through this step by step. We initialize the algorithm by picking either a control policy or a sequence of states and control inputs. So let's do the control policy thing. We just assume we have some control policy, whatever it is. We have something. Maybe it's just all zeros always. Then, starting at step one, we execute the current policy and record the resulting state input trajectory shown here. Now we have a feasible trajectory. We have something that actually just happened that we can do. If this was our target trajectory, we kind of could do just like LQR to stay on that trajectory. But actually, this was kind of an arbitrary trajectory. We picked some arbitrary sequence of controls. We found the trajectory. But it is feasible, which is nice. Then we compute the linear quadratic approximation of the optimal control problem around the obtained state input trajectory by doing first order Taylor expansion of dynamics and second order Taylor expansion of the cost function. So we had a very general cost function, right? Could be anything. But we can do first and second order approximations for dynamics and cost function, respectively. Once we have that, we have a linear time varying quadratic control problem. So we can use LQR backups to solve the optimal control policy for each time. 
which we call pi i plus 1, where i plus 1 here is the iteration in the outer loop of the algorithm. Then we can go back here, execute that policy, and repeat. So this is kind of an iterative process where you have a policy, find a better policy, find a yet better policy over and over and over. Now I haven't yet proven that this is always going to improve the policy, but that's the intuition. That's what we're hoping for that. Now, um, what would it actually look like in equations? Um, this is what it looks like. Right? We have a linear approximation to dynamics. And we'll have a quadratic approximation to the cost function. And here is our new state zt, vt, for new controls, centered around the previous trajectory we found, then our A matrix, our B matrix, our Q, and R. Here we're assuming that our cost function depends on x and u separately. Otherwise, you have some quadratic terms that cross between x and u. Usually, people don't have much crossing between x and u. They penalize for state, what they would like about state, penalize for controls, what they care about for controls. And so most of the time, um, it'll look like this. But in principle, you could have a cross term between x and u. Um, so this is all we need to compute the A, B, Q, R, and then we can do our linear time varying system backups, and we find our new sequence of feedback matrices. We're allowed based on that, and go again. OK, so as we look at it here, it's actually pretty simple. Um, yeah, you might have to do some, get some derivatives, but actually, I mean, you can just do a finite difference if you don't have an automatic differentiation through your system. Just do a finite difference. If you do have automatic differentiation available, you can just automatically get the derivatives out. Either way is fine. So does this converge? It need not converge as, as I formulated it, actually. The reason is the optimal policy, and this is really important, the optimal policy for the approximation we're making might end up not staying close to the sequence of points around which the LQ approximation was computed by Taylor expansion. So if this linear time varying system with quadratic costs, we find the optimal solution to it. But if that optimal solution is far away, from the previous trajectory, then yeah, it's optimal for the linear time varying system, but it's in such a different part of the space where that linear approximation is just not precise. And so it's actually not optimal for the original system at all. It might not even be imp improvement. It might be worse. So you have to be careful about using your linear approximation and your quadratic approximation in the region where they're valid. How can you do this? You might say, well, let's just solve and then do some step sizing. Uh, you could try to do that, but actually, that might not be the best thing to do. You can do something much better here. We want to stay close to where our approximation is valid. Where is it valid? It's valid close to the XTIs and UTIs that we had from our previous trajectory, because that's where we linearized and quadraticized. So we're going to add a cost term to stay close to that. And we know that if this cost term is big enough, if this dominates, we're going to try to stay very close to where we were before. And then we have a little bit of the actual cost we care about, which will pull us off a little bit of that trajectory we had before to do a little better on the original cost function. And so if we set it up this way, with large enough alpha, but still enough, a little bit of weight on the original cost, we'll gradually improve. We're guaranteed to improve. Why is this so much better than just a regular line search? Imagine you, you know, just did the regular thing, and it was worse. You did a rollout with a policy, but it was like going elsewhere and really bad. Well, it's not clear what that line search would do. You're kind of trying to decrease your controls. What are you trying to do in that line search? It's not clear, right? But what we have here is a way to ensure in a dynamic programming way, everywhere along the trajectory, that we ensure we stay close. It's part of our objective. When we're early on executing, we're already thinking ahead and saying, don't just care about the cost G. Make sure we also stay close to where we were before, because otherwise I cannot trust my linear approximation and hence not the result of this calculation that I do to find controls. And so you'll have to do a bit of a line search on this alpha. You have to like, you know, play around with alpha. If you make alpha uh, close to 0, then you can make big updates. And you can see maybe it's a lot of improvement. You're good to go. So what you would do is effectively you would do this with some setting of alpha. And if things improved, you say, OK, good to go. If things got worse, you might say, OK, I need to make alpha larger because it got worse, which means the linear approximation was not good enough where I ended up, so I need to put more emphasis on that being valid. 
So often it's described as a trust region approach where you have a notion of you trust the function you're optimizing. You have an approximation to the thing you're optimizing and you have a region in which you trust that approximation and you're only willing to optimize within that region. It's not exactly a constrained region here. It's more penalizing for going too far away than having a hard constraint, but it's the same idea because we know when you have a hard constraint, effectively you just put a Lagrange multiplier in front of it and it becomes a penalty again. It's equivalent. It's just that here we might not know the exact setting we need to use for that alpha, but if we knew magically the right setting, it'd be good, and we, can, we don't have to do anything more complicated than just checking. Is the solution making <laughs> progress on the previous one we had or not? And if that's the case, we're good. If it's not the case, make sure we penalize more for deviation. Some practicalities. F is nonlinear, has this non-convex optimization problem, so you can get stuck in local optima. So good initialization matters for this now. In the original linear system, linear time varying system, initialization didn't matter. We're going to find the global optimum. But now we have a nonlinear problem. We have an initial policy we roll out. And it's along that trajectory we're going to start building improvements. And so wherever we start, it will affect what kind of trajectory we find in the end of this optimization. The cost function g, g could be non-convex. And actually, then we can have issues where the q that we've been working with, the second order approximation, is not positive definite. That's a problem, because as we talked about, you can get very weird behaviors. It's not positive definite. It's not even clear what you're doing. With that, you know, setting grand equal to zero for a non-positive definite quadratic function, you're kind of going to that fixed point, but it could be a maximum or a saddle point. It's not clear that's where you should be going. So we should avoid that. So you should check. You should check that the Q and R that you find from your second order approximation are positive definite. And if they're not, you should add terms to it. And in fact, if you make your alpha big enough, that alpha is essentially putting an, adding an identity scaled by alpha to your Q and R. And so if you make your alpha big enough, at some point, they will become positive definite again. And that would be the way to get there. And that's a check you might want to do ahead of time. Not just see does it work, does it not work. You just say, OK, is everything positive definite or not? If not, keep adding till you're finally positive definite. Then there's something else called differential dynamic programming. What I described so far, a lot of people would call iterative LQR or ILQR. Then a lot of people talk about this thing, differential dynamic programming. And people don't always really distinguish between the two. They're two different things. But often people use the names interchangeably. They'll say, I'm running DDP, I'm running ILQR, whatever. And it's actually, they don't even know which one they're running of the two. Um, but that, that's kind of fine. They're very similar. I mean, ultimately, that's just a vocabulary thing. Um, the difference is in what we saw so far, we do a linear approximation of dynamics, quadratic approximation of cost. In differential dynamic programming, the differential thing, the approximations are happening in the Bellman equation itself. So you will actually, let's do a comparison, DDP, and this is when we just look at U. You'll actually look at the Bellman equation, shown on the left there. You'll do a second order approximation of the Bellman equation itself. There'll be terms with x also if we care about that, but in this case we're just doing u. Whereas in iterative LQR, we have a Bellman equation where we, ahead of time, make the Bellman equation have quadratic cost and linear dynamics. And what we see actually on the left, when we do it on the Bellman equation itself, there'll be an extra term here that appears. The details don't matter too much, but an extra term will appear. Um, and actually, that extra term could make it, again, non-positive definite, and you might have to deal with that. And so, well, you might argue, well, the extra term is great to have. Maybe it makes it more um, precise and so forth. So we can do that. And um, I don't think people have particularly strong opinions which one of the two might be uh, working better. In practice, it's a lot easier often to just do iterative LQR than to also worry about this extra term that pops up in the Bellman equation, which max might make things non-convex again. And harder to deal with. OK, so we've covered a lot um, from this one core idea. Can we do even better? Yes. At convergence of ILQR and DDP, we end up with linearizations around the state input trajectory the algorithm converged to. In practice, as we talked about, the system could not be on the trajectory or not even that close due to perturbations or the initial state being off, the dynamics model being off, and so forth. What then might happen is that we're kind of out of the regime 
where the linear approximation is as good as we would want it to be. So what now? Well, if you're already working on your homework one, you have actually done something very similar already. We can do a look ahead. In homework one, you have a grid-based approximation to your state space. And so you get a crude value function with a crude discretization. But then you can do a couple steps look ahead to optimize for the actions you take in the first few steps and then cap it off with the value function after those steps. So if we do that here, effectively the result of doing the ILQR is a value function for all times, a quadratic value function that shows how you want to approach the trajectory, what's a bad deviation versus a good deviation from the trajectory. And then you run an optimization to find the optimal controls for, let's say, five-step look ahead, 10-step look ahead in the moment. How are we going to run that optimization? In your homework one, you do it with uh, enumeration or cross-entropy method and so forth. Here we actually have a method. We can run iterative LQR inside this process. So we can say, OK, at time t, as you generate a control input, we could resolve the control problem using ILQR DDP over time steps t through h all the way till the end. That would be a lot of work. Or over a shorter horizon and cap it off with a value function there. And so this gives you much better performance, because now in the moment you're looking at the nonlinear model that you have, re-optimizing against it. But in practice, you can't look as far ahead as you should to make the best decisions. But you've done that ahead of time, and from that you have a value function, a cost to go function, that you can use so you only have to look ahead five to 10 steps. How far should you look ahead? Well, you can actually look at this, right? For example, for the helicopter problem, what did we do? We would look at, okay, um, if we run it with five steps look ahead, 10 steps look ahead, 20 steps look ahead, what happens? We would notice that at the time with, I believe it was um, 40 steps look ahead maybe. I, sh I should look it up, but it was, it was some number. So in step of look ahead, 40, 40 steps look ahead, I think, we saw it was essentially always back on the trajectory. If after 40 steps of look ahead, your optimization predicts you to be back on the trajectory, looking further ahead is not going to help you. Because looking further ahead is just going to get you on a trajectory after 40 steps, and then after that, keep you on a trajectory. But the value function is already really good around the trajectory. So once you're pretty close to your trajectory, the notion that you can keep it on, you already know that. There's nothing interesting happening there. So you would actually look at, OK, how long does it typically take to get pretty close again, to get back into the regime where my value function is precise, where my linear and quadratic approximation are good? And that's the amount of look ahead that you need. And you do that amount of look ahead, you're essentially doing the optimal thing. Everything after that was a waste of cycles. It, the value function already tells you what you would have gotten from that. So um, now you need a pretty optimized implementation, typically. Because if you're running this kind of look ahead inside your control loop, and let's say you do 20 hertz control, then you have 1 20th of a second to run this iterative valve QR, which might require multiple outer loops to finally get your controls, execute the first one, and repeat. Now, one of the nice things is that you have a good initialization, because you already had your k matrices, which tells you your attempted feedback control. You can use that as your initialization trajectory, and then from there, run iterative LQR to resolve. OK, now, here's another thing to think about. Multiplicative noise is a very interesting kind of noise model. Here, the noise is not added in but there's this matrix BW, and the WT lives here. And if you apply zero control, there will be zero noise. But the more control you apply, the more noise you introduce into the system. That's actually very common in reality. And there are some models of human control that kind of seem, if you model human control this way, it matches up pretty well. If we do very high uh, force output, we'll have more noise in our execution than if we do something that's low force. It's natural. Um, you can actually re-derive. It turns out that with this setting, you, you can end up with a similar set of updates. Find k matrices and p matrices. And what you'll see happen um, in an interesting way is effectively it'll, in some sense, it becomes equivalent if you work through it. It's as if you're having a new q and a new r. But it might make it easier to design your q and r. Because if this is really how your system works, there might be easy to think about the right q and r with this in mind. And then as you go through the opposite, you'll see, well, it's the same as before, but it's as if I had used different Q and R, but it essentially gave you a transformation to tell you, you know, what the right additive noise situation Q and R would be if you care really about this. 
All right, let's look at a couple of examples here. Card pull. Here's the nonlinear system. Definitely nonlinear, a lot of nonlinearity. Let's balance this card pull. We design an LQR controller for balancing. Then what we can do is we can say, okay, for all starting points, or a range of starting points, does this linear feedback controller bring us back? Let's take a look. For horizontal axis here is x, vertical axis is theta. Um, we're not plotting x dot and theta dot, but we start with, uh, I believe, uh, zero for both. These are initial conditions. Green means that the linear feedback controller succeeded. So a pretty wide range of starting points from where the linear feedback controller succeeded. Definitely a nonlinear system, but it is able to pull it in. Um, this is for a diagonal cost matrix on state and no penalty on controls. Now, what will happen in practice is when you do this, you'll, you'll look at this and say, what if I change the cost matrices? How well will it do? We talked about this earlier. Your cost matrices will affect your linear controller, and your linear controller will affect whether your system is precisely modeled by a linear system or not, where you are. OK, let's change it. We'll penalize for controls. You might say small controls. Linear model will be better. Turns out it actually does worse. What might be going on here? Well, in the linear model, even with, even with small controls, you bring yourself back to the equilibrium state. And so it gets penalized for controls and say, well, I'm going to be patient. I'm not going to apply too much control. I can gradually bring it back. The linear system allows me to bring it gradually back. But the nonlinear system will be like, ah, I'm already falling. And that car pull is down, and you're never bringing it back. And so it's an interesting effect here where it's not always super intuitive ahead of time. I would have thought if somebody told me if I'm going to penalize more for controls, it's going to do even better. Because, well, the smaller the inputs are, the, close, the better the linear approximation is, but actually something else happens. The look ahead tends to be that it doesn't care enough about control anymore because it doesn't need to for the linear system, but actually needs higher control for the nonlinear system. All right, it's uh, 12.30, so let's stop here and we'll continue this next week.